I am so glad you are here today for the Content Creation Made Easy session this week because I am talking to an expert in a field that we all desperately need more information about. Um, I want you to meet Adela Hussain. She is the founder of Startups & Co. The reason I'm asking Adela to be on here today is she is a master at helping people pitch their businesses to the people who should know you because you are probably the best kept secret out there in your field. Um, Adela has a background. She discovered that she has a talent for pitching when she first started doing PR on her own in a fashion tech startup a while ago. And she got featured in 14 publications um, for over a year. And then she was also in the Harvard Business Review and she didn't even pitch to them. So I am actually working with Adela in a mastermind that we belong to together. And I knew, so I know her personally and I know her expertise. Um, but once you meet her and listen to her, and plus she's got this lovely accent that you're going to fall in love with, um, she just has this high energy and she's known for her laser sharp thinking, which I have experienced firsthand. So I'm going to have her tell you a little bit about how she got here, but ultimately you are going to want to listen to how to learn how to pitch yourself, your programs, your services to get in front of other people's platforms, how to do it well, what mistakes to avoid, and how to kind of expand your reach beyond what you're currently doing with your content marketing. So Adela, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Jen, for that beautiful, beautiful and warm welcome. I feel very honored to be here. And um, God, what a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Well, I wanted to have you on because I know personally that using other people's platforms is kind of a way to have wings on your back to um, expand what you're currently doing, regardless of your current marketing situation. So I just know that you can help us expand and kind of get exponential, right? And that's, I yes. think, your expertise. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm I'm very deeply passionate about helping entrepreneurs get seen, paid and heard um, in a way that feels really authentic to them as well. Um, the main reason being is because you mentioned in my introduction that I, I ran a fashion tech company and I really saw when I was running what was a very complicated business back in 2016, you know, this, this fashion tech company I ran was a, both a product and a service-based business. So uh, for anyone listening who may be from North America, there's a company called Stitch Fix, which curates outfits for women and sends personalized outfits to their door. And I'd seen, I was a, a management consultant and I was working in the strategy team at Sky uh, back in 2015. Uh, and I saw what um, Stitchwick was doing in the US. And I thought, why is no one doing that here in Europe and, and here in the UK? So I launched that business, but PR was something I did from day one. Um, the minute I launched that business and the, the, everything went live, I did it from day one. And I saw the immediate effects of doing that from day one. So this is why I'm very passionate about entrepreneurs starting their PR journey from the minute they begin, because honestly, that is how I, how, how, how I managed to pitch myself into the media very fast in the space of 12 to 14 months. I want to, I'm going to ask you, I want to put a pin in this question, which is how did you know how to do it intuitively? And if we didn't do it intuitively from the start, are we screwed? Can we go back? <laughs> I love this. This is, <clears throat> this is such a great question. So how did I know how to pitch people intuitively? So um, this actually goes back to my, my career. So uh, before I ran my fashion tech business, I mentioned I was in, in the strategy team at Sky here in the UK, but I was actually a management consultant for a good sort of 17 years before that. Uh, so at Accenture, you know, which, which is an American company um, and, uh, and a few other smaller consulting firms. And I was working in, in what is very corporate, right? So my clients were investment banks, they were companies like Unilever, they were airlines. And I was working for, you know, very senior, mainly men actually, um, in corporate environments. And I had to build trust very, very quickly. And at the very start of my career, I was doing quite messy roles, like going in and, and identifying the teams that needed to be fired, right? And then taking those teams and those business processes and outsourcing, you know, the, the real true meaning of the word outsource is, is like taking that work and putting it offshore. And I was traveling out to India 
uh, with people that were losing their jobs, telling them to sit next to the person out in India who's taking over their job and managing the process, which is called knowledge transfer. And imagine if you're doing that from age 23, you're like the most hated person in the <laughs> office, right? And this is why like corporate companies hire management consultants to do this work, you know, even, you know, so I was sitting there with people like from Bain, McKinsey and BCG who don't even do the implementation. They kind of came out with the numbers of people that had to be had to you know be cut and I would go and do the actual cutting you're so like George from, Clooney you're like George it, Clooney it, up in it, the air movie it was absolutely that George Clooney film up in the air was exactly my role like down to how he dressed I was the woman he, he was a woman he had a sidekick right there was another woman and they think fell in love Kendrick, like, I think. yeah yeah, yeah they, they fell in love and I, I didn't fall in love with my friend <laughs> Our colleagues, but I was certainly the, the, the person with them. I was doing that role. I was absolutely doing that role and um, traveling around the world. And, and you learn to build, like when you are, this is a slightly depressing thing to say, but when you are the most hated person that's entered an, an office, you have to learn to build trust very, very quickly. Um, and you do that by building relationships. And so, you know, Dave from accountant, account, from the accounting department who knows he's going to lose his job, eventually he'll give you the data that you need, but you have to learn to build trust very quickly. So actually those skills, when it came to fashion journalists, yes, they're a tough crew when I was pitching to them, but it wasn't anything, it wasn't as hostile as what I was used to. So dating. this was like a, it was like a vacation after that kind of a job. Yeah, yeah, it was. But I, I mean, I was in that specific area of, of outsourcing for seven years. And then I, you know, eventually you get tired of not yeah, being really. liked. Yeah. And then you, and then I ended up going into the more uh, sexier side of management consulting <laughs> where, where you build companies and you transform companies and you launch products um, and you merge stuff. And, it, and it's so much more fun. It's yeah. so much more fun. So, um, but the key, the th key thing to really note from that, that background is whoever you are pitching to, whoever you are trying to collaborate with in the name of PR and growing your business, you need to build a relationship first. Mm -hmm. And that all comes down to building trust. Mm -hmm. And people don't talk about trust enough in this industry, right? They, talk, they do talk about trust in terms of sleazy selling, yeah. but they don't talk about it in terms of growth, I don't think. Yeah, that's interesting. The trust, if you know how, if you can start cultivating trust with people and you do that from the minute you start your business, mm -hmm. even if you're not pitching something, you're just starting to like someone, you're starting to know their content, starting to reply to their emails, you will get noticed. And that's how you start building trust. And that is the most powerful thing you have as a CEO, right? Yeah, because in today's world, especially our audience, or whoever we're trying to be in relationship with, we're very cynical, we're very smart, we're very savvy. We don't believe that anything is real. Uh, we're just bombarded every day with proof that we shouldn't trust people. So to, before you answer the question about what if you haven't done this yet and is it too late, um, what are some of the, the suggestions or your favorite ways to build trust early on with somebody that could be completely cold to you? Yes, I love this. The easiest takeaway I recommend people take from this interview is just Google the trust equation. Oh. There's a really brilliant equation called the trust equation that was actually developed by, I think, three management consultants. Um, there was a book, I think, called The Trusted Advisor. But the trust equation is something I actually teach in my, my own course, Pitch to Press. But the tr trust is broken down um, by... Um, several components okay. one component is reliability uh the other component is credibility um and I'm, i can't remember the third one it's all over um uh, self-interest so what it means is in order to build trust with someone you need oh, consistency is the third one you need to be reliable you need to constantly be reliable you do what you say you're going to do right so that's I, on component number one the second one is um consistency you're putting out content you're putting out the same message again and again so you're not just posting about avocados and toast you're posting about what you're genuinely uh what you genuinely do right and it and it makes sense 
And then what was the third one I mentioned? Um, there was underneath the equation is self-interest. So if you yes. talk about yourself too much, trust goes down because people think, well, it's not about us and what we as an audience need. It's actually about them and their hairstyle the whole time or their outfit the whole time. So you Google the trust equation. And that is, if you really want to understand analytically how to start building trust in your business, that's a brilliant equation to look up. Oh my God, I could talk about that all day because when you're creating content, you have to be reliable. You have to be, you have to have a consistent message and yeah. it has to be about them. Answer the question, what's in it for them? Not what's, uh, what's it about for you? I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to go, I'm going to make that part of my content, I think. Um, okay. So the question that I originally had is, so you had this idea to create kind of a stitch fix kind of thing, but in across, you know, across the pond from us, yes. um, what if we have not done, what if we're several years into our business and we have not yet done this piece of using other people's platforms in an intuitive way? Are we just, is it too late for us? No, not at all. It absolutely isn't too late to start. And actually, you know, the day that you start is, is the day you start sowing the seeds. So um, don't, the, so don't worry if you're kind of two or three or four years into your business. In actual fact, if you are at that stage and you have got over what I call like the two year cliff where most businesses fail at two years, don't they? So they, they kind of run out of money at year two and then the, the stats show, the data shows, that, you know, very few businesses make it past year two unless they've genuinely got a strong product or service. So if you are in year three or year four, that's fantastic. That shows that people are buying your product or your service and that they love what you do because you wouldn't be in business in year three or four if that if that wasn't the case. So in actual fact, I would feel more comfortable then and, you know, that you would have a strong story to tell by then, you know. Yeah, and, and your messaging would probably be much clearer, much more laser focused at that point too. Absolutely, because you probably would have experimented so many times in that period. <laughs> Like all you know, over the place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You would have honed in exactly who your client is and how they need to be spoken to. And, and, and you would start identifying where they hang out. So you would be able to start your publicity on a strong front, but on a strong foot by identifying exactly, you know, where your audience hangs out. Well, okay. Boom. Now that we know all the, we know why we know, like you're clearly an expert on this. You've done it yourself. Let's talk about, you know, why is using other people's platforms a vital thing that we really need to be spending time doing in our own business? Yes. The key answer is really efficiency right? <laughs> because it is so much easier to, you know, I love this phrase, dance on other people's dance floors. Oh yeah, that's cute. Uh, it's great. And actually, to be frank, it's not actually my 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 line. There's a lovely entrepreneur I follow called Jada Selna, who actually came out with that line. So I always credit her when, when um, I say dance on other people's dance floors. But it's better to dance on other people's dance floors or go where your audience hangs out yeah. than build that audience from scratch. Starting to build an audience completely from scratch organically is just near impossible these days, unless you've got a lot of money to throw at Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Um, and all the other strategies that you can use. Whereas if you're, you know, producing beautiful content already and you're, you know, starting to pitch to people who hold those audiences, that's just so much more efficient. Yeah, I love that. Efficiency um, is vital because you have a lot of other things to do when you are, at, especially when you're a solopreneur, there's just so much to do. So let's be efficient. Fantastic. It's efficient and it's easier. Like it's just it's it's less stressful because yeah, those yeah. people are already following uh, someone you know uh, that other individual you may be collaborating with or reading that piece of media already and so why would you start from scratch it doesn't make it doesn't make sense this is this is a good message for those of us who tend to make things harder for ourselves than they have to be like this is the easy, like this is hitting the easy button. This is, and it's not like it's, it's not like it's easy because you do still have to find the platforms. You do still have to pitch, but like, this is one of the things we can do to make our life a little bit easier. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the, the other reason why you would do it as well is because you're doing it. Remember we, we talked about trust at the beginning, right? And one of the, uh, the uh, components of trust is credibility. Yeah. So when we increase credibility 
on the right hand side of this equation, we increase trust on the left hand side of the equation. So when you start associating your brand with other people's brands through a collaboration, a partnership, or you get featured in a great piece of media, you are actually borrowing the credibility and trust of that brand. You know, if you're featured in the Times, you know, you know, Jen, if you were featured person in the Times, Jen Liddy in the Times, it would mean Jen against the Times logo. Your credibility immediately would boost up. Skyrocket. Right? Yeah. So that's also, you're borrowing trust from existing I love that. credibility holders, if you like. So yeah. that's exactly why, another reason why you would do it. So it isn't just efficiency, but it's actually, you know, the credibility markers that, that you're going for. So um, what are some of the, I mean, because everybody has them, what are some of the uh, mistakes or myths or limiting beliefs that people have about using other people's media? Yes, I love this question. So <laughs> it, it's such a it's such a big one, right? So a typical um, limiting belief that I, I hear this day in and day out, on pretty much every call I have with someone is, um, I don't think I'm good enough for media. Oh, I'm not, I'm not ready yet for media. Um, and, and what that often means is people think, you know, I'm not big enough, I'm not famous enough, um, I'm not credible enough. So they might be starting, um, but you know, they forget they have to start from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not good enough. There's a whole piece around self-worthiness, right? So that's the kind of first limiting belief I see from people. The second major limiting belief I see is that there's this weird like sense that journalists or people in the media are these like superhuman people that are kind of on this power dynamic and that they're above you in some weird way. Right. So, you know, that, you know, if you pitch, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, working from home, you pitching to a journalist at the Times, for example, um, you know, the, the you're not good enough for the times. The, the, if the journalist replies to you, it's like you know Madonna replying in your inbox. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that you're not worthy of it. And so it, it is again, it is the self worthy piece. But there's this notion that these journalists are gods, right? And they're yeah. not. They're not gods. That's actually one of my affirmations. I teach people is write on a post that journalists are not gods, <laughs> and, that you, and that you genuinely keep them in your, in their jobs. Yeah, that, it, that I never really thought about that without you pitching, pitching a story. You know, like this is a great example. Um, I asked Adela to be on my podcast. I asked her, I invited her because of her expertise, but there are plenty of times where people are pitching me and sometimes it's just exactly what I need or it fills a hole in my content calendar or it adds a dimension that I never thought of. And it just makes my life as a content creator that much easier. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is a piece that lots of people, um, entrepreneurs, you know, at the very early stage or even whatever stage, they forget that they are creating a story. Right. And without that story, content creators, journalists, podcasters, bloggers, influencers, other entrepreneurs, they can't exist without those stories. People need to post content. They need to post stories feature stories regularly and so you as an entrepreneur are in a, are in a really powerful position to offer a story uh, and, and people forget that so I always say when you offer up a story you're helping someone in their job you really are and I say that as someone who has unfortunately done a George Clooney on Sky Sports News and sat in the newsroom and had to work out which teams are going and unfortunately <laughs> It was a journalist who didn't come in day, day in and day out with strong stories um, mm. to their Monday morning planning meetings that often got the chop, you know. Um, so it is absolutely fact. If you do not give someone a story, they can't survive in their job. That's a way to turn it on people's heads, especially because a lot of the people that I work with are um, highly sensitive entrepreneurs. So they're very concerned about what other people, you know, how they're other people's energy, what other people need and what other people think, and they're very heart centered. And so what Adela just said is very dead on for those of us who are heart centered and want to help other people. This is a great way. It's a symbiotic relationship, really. It's not a one-way relationship. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Really helpful. And, 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 if we want to get even more laser focused on those individuals that are highly sensitive, uh -huh. um, you know, experts, 
especially for those business owners that might have uh, been a field that is helping people in quite tough situations. I would say when you're pitching a story, um, imagine that your customer or your client is reading it at the other end yeah. and they really need to hear your story. They really need to know how to work with you because they are in a crisis mode. You are um, really so a solution for somebody else. You really are a solution. And I say this because I have uh, uh, currently clients who are people who help you know, women with trauma, women who are coming out of domestic violent relationships, uh, women who might be coming out of divorces. You know, I have some experts, you know, have, have worked with clinical psychologists on eating disorders. When they put a story out there on that subject, it just, it just makes me feel good about the work that I do. But at the end of the day, it, it's helping someone. It's absolutely helping someone at the other end. So heart-centered people really need to, to remember that, you know, you're not putting your story for your own business and your own ego. You're putting it out there what's for your, for them. For them. Exactly. What's in it for them. And yes, um, you, you've, I've heard you tell the example. It's not always these like huge heroic stories that work. You told a story about a woman who, hmm, I feel like it was you who told a story about a woman who uh, like, I know how to make lunch, making lunch for your kids easier. I can pitch, you know, uh, it was a back to school thing. And I wanted to pitch, you know, how to make lunch easier because it's back to school time. Those are, that's like not, that's not like a, a deeply moving story, but it's life-changing for some mom who's sick of making uh, lunch for her kids, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it, again, it comes back to who are you helping, right? You know, you don't need to give a deep earth shattering heroes yes. journey story when you pitch <laughs> to the media yes. um it's simply providing um a solution to to someone for for some pain point that's out there yeah. the reason that it gets featured in the media is because often it's hooked into something that's going on so in that example um the timing makes sense because it's back to school yes. so anyone who works you know in the field of nutrition or food and health and, and children would know that they ought to pitch that probably in june time if it was written media ready for publication in september because right, right, right. most magazines work three to four months ahead brilliant whereas if it's online it would be a little bit of a shorter time frame right that's another thing to think about you're giving us so many great tidbits to help people kind of overcome these limiting stories and beliefs that they are, are, you know, that they don't have a place in doing this. How can we, what are some basics to get us started in thinking about the stories that we could pitch to people? Mm, I love this question. So um, in thinking about your stories, what I would do first of all, is I love this um, strategy called newsjacking, where you think about what is currently going on in your industry right now in the news and what can you actually piggyback on, right? So um, for example, a really, it's really a deep, you know, significant example, but one of my uh, former clients is a clinical psychologist called Anna. And um, Anna, um, you know, is very good at getting into the media, right? But she often, what, what makes sets Anna apart is that she does it on the back of an existing running news story. So, you know, Anna's expert topics is typically things like anxiety, bullying, and eating disorders in children. And anxiety was, was very high recently in the world, uh, you know, about six weeks ago when, um, you know, there, there was a war, right, in, in Ukraine and you know, lots of things happening in, in that part of the world. And so Anna pitched into the media how to talk to your child about the war in Ukraine. And it was just such a powerful story because she didn't pitch, um, you know, uh, you know, let's talk about anxiety or I'm an expert in anxiety and here are five ways to get over your anxiety, which is, you know, kind of, you, I mean, you do see those stories out there, but Anna, you know, 
she actually was on the TV show first on This Morning in the UK, and then it got written up in the Daily Mail. But that it was simply because she, she shared her expertise in relation to what was going on in the media, which is a war in Ukraine, and anticipating that parents are going to be very anxious, trying to want and wondering how to explain to anxious children about this war. Like, how do you explain it? And as a clinical psychologist, she has expertise on that and can share strategies on that. So that's a very good example. So for anyone listening today, I would really advise, think about what is going on in your industry and what can you piggyback on that makes sense? How can you add value to an existing story? The other thing I heard you say that I want to make sure everybody hears is Anna had some really specific um, expert topics that she can always, that are always her goes, go-tos. So she doesn't, she's not constantly like having the radar in her brain go like, boop, boop, like just searching for what could it possibly, she knows she's got these three things that she always goes to. And then the question with your news jacking is how can I take one of these things and make it more laser focused and applicable to something going on right now? So that is a really great tip. And I have to say, you've even got me thinking um, I just have done a 30 day reel challenge on Instagram, which I mm -hmm. hate reels and I would love to see them blow up, but I have been doing them for 28 days. And just today I found all of the wins that I had from doing reels, both tangible and intangible or measurable and immeasurable. And I'm like, I could reach out to somebody who's an Instagram reels expert and ask them to talk to me about why getting, if you're, if you like always talk about reels, I could talk about how creating reels could, you know, help you do X, Y, and Z. And that would be a way to take something that I'm an expert in, which is content and then laser focus it into reels and help them with their content. Um, and it would be, it would be, it would require me to pitch myself, but I have just in listening to you talk about that, you gave me a story and I'm really hoping that everybody listening can kind of open their brain and think about what are my content go-tos and then how can I laser focus that? That's an absolute gem. Yes, yes. No, I love it. I love the fact that you're coming up with ideas. During As we're talking. <laughs> recording. It's great. It's great. And it's sparking ideas. Yeah. And and I mean, in what you're describing, in the situation you're describing there is it's a perfect collaboration, right? You're right, identifying right. who you would collaborate with and where there would be synergy for that collaboration, what specifically that synergy would be. So immediately in your pitch, you know that you would need to talk about, you know, reels and you need to link to an Instagram expert and you need to explain why and how you can add value to their audience. And, you know, you've you've really got the, craft, the kind of gems for a good pitch there. Um, so, yes, absolutely. It's, it's thinking. Place. Yeah, sorry. I, lo I love that even even if people who are listening just take those two little basics and start to open their mind and ask, how can I use what I already know and am, ex am an expert in to apply to somebody else's platform? That yes. alone, if, if you stop listening now, <laughs> that, that is what we want you to take away from this. That is so, so, so many gems. I yes, absolutely. Yes. So can I ask you about the mistakes that that are that are most prevalent when people are pitching other people mm, love this love this <laughs> it's this <is> my favorite <laughs> favorite topic let's talk about your mistakes oh dear oh god i do tend to moan a lot about the mistakes um <laughs> okay so the classic mistake that so many entrepreneurs make and it's it's not their fault right it's, it's, a, it's a big caveat to this you don't know what you don't know right so you're just starting out um, but what typically a lot of people do is they download some swipe copy off the internet and they send out a pitch using some random swipe copy. And that swipe copy, whatever they, they've got hold of, is just not personal, right? So they have they call it like, I think, you know, spray. There's this kind of funny <laughs> phrase in the industry of spraying your pictures out, which sounds a bit gross, but, you know, Especially people in COVID just, times. That's I know, I know. It's like, it's, it's like a flu, it's just spraying these really <laughs> impersonal pictures out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the, the biggest, biggest mistake people make is they just don't, they send out a pitch. There's nothing personal on that email pitch or voice note pitch, right? however they sent the pitch. And it could have been sent to anybody. And the person receiving it at the other end is just like, literally swipe right. <laughs> like not interested you yeah. know if, 
um and, and I've received those kinds of pictures and it, honestly it just makes me feel a bit bit icky because I feel like I'm not I end up getting on the other side of this I'm not worthy enough for someone to have done the research and really listen to my content right and understand where I've been featured what I've been written written in um you know on the flip side the best picture I've ever received from someone was someone on my email list who re-quoted back uh, a story I'd written in the subject line of the email so I wrote this really quirky story. I can't remember what I was doing with this email, but I wrote this really ridiculous story about how um, people steal croissants when they go on holiday from the breakfast bar. <laughs> and I was trying to make some, there was some point to the story, right? <laughs> there always is. There is always is. And it was a really funny one because, you know, everyone, I don't know about the US, right? I've not seen it so much in the US, but in France, the U- Brits, British people have a bad reputation for going over to Paris, staying in a hotel and stealing croissants for That's lunch. Sure. We will take have- little bananas and then not eat them. They'll go back I- in your purse. <laughs> we, we do croissants. It's really bad. People who go for lunch, they do croissants, you know, and they steal the croissants. And it's it's, it's tough, it's tough. Um, and, that, and that was me as well, okay? So I don't excuse myself from that. I was, I, I love croissants and I used, I hold up my hand. I used to steal croissants. <laughs> I stole them from the breakfast bar, but I wrote this really funny email and every, lots of people replied and loved it. But a week later, this, this woman pitched me something and she put in her subject line, something along the lines of, you had me at croissants or something. So she'd, yeah. she had taken the line, you had me at hello from Jerry, Jerry yeah. Maguire and then twisted it for the croissants. And it was just, I mean, she was a copywriter, right? And she was just funny and clever. Everything I had in my inbox at that moment when it came up got ignored uh-huh. because of that subject line. It was such that. a great subject line. So Sorry. personalizing is how to avoid the mistake, going and exploring the person before you pitch them to make sure they're a good fit, um, saying people's words back to them. Those are some easily implementable ways to avoid these mistakes. Absolutely, absolutely. And the requoting yeah. back is one of the most powerful things you could ever do. It really is so powerful because we are all so egoic. You know, it, if you consider when we pitch somebody, it's all about them, right? But when somebody pitches us, it's all about us. It gets to be all about, like, we're just as egoic as everybody else. So we want to hear our own words and our own names said back to us. So yes, use yeah. what we learned in the first part of this interview when you are pitching. And it just shows that you've done your homework, right? Yeah. The fact that you're quoting someone shows that you have researched them um, and you know their content and you've done that, the, the homework, you know they're a good fit for you. Yeah. So the person receiving the pitch immediately is like, well, if they've done the research, the due diligence and check that we're a good fit, yeah. obviously they, they themselves would do it, double check. But that pitch will absolutely get to the top of their, top of their list. It really will, you know. Can I add a little tweak that I love to share with my audience for um, when... I am writing anything. I'll write it the first time. And then I'll do a scan on the left side of my margins to see how many of my sentences start with I. And if too many sentences start with I, I go in and I try to tweak them to make it not about me, to make it more interesting or the, the sentence more interesting or to make it about them. And it takes a little bit of extra time, but it is such a game changer when you're doing your pitching. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Count the number of eyes versus <laughs> yeah. use. Yeah. Use. If there's more use, then you'll know you're in the right place. Right, right. If there's you're, more it, eyes, yeah, it's yeah. another equation. <laughs> yeah, it is right. Um, there's been so much gold in this interview, Adela. I love the little actionable things that we can take. How much time do you think people should or can spend a week pitching? Oh, I love this. This is a really good question. Um, How much time should you spend? Right. It depends how it's a hard question, right? Because you actually need to know how how much growth you want in your business um, and, you know, work back from there. So if you're looking to really, really grow fast and grow big, um, you know, you could end up pitching, you know, two or three days a week. Uh, you know, yeah. nonstop, because you might want to be on four podcasts a week, 
or you might want to be in one magazine per month and you need to allow the time for that. Um, as a good concrete example for my last business, um, Star Lyrical, I was at two events per night, you know, for that business. And I was pitching probably nonstop. I was probably doing client customer stuff two days a week and probably nonstop marketing three days a week, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it was, it was a lot of work, but you know, if you're go growing gradually, it doesn't need to be at that amount of effort. It could be that you dedicate an afternoon it starts more an afternoon a week on yeah. researching identifying pictures and then when you know what I end up seeing and what I really love is when people get the snowball effect yeah. so when people start getting featured on one or two podcasts they're like wow it actually works and they start getting addicted to that yeah. I think you may have had that right you yeah. suddenly start seeing the results and then you think right if I ramp it up a bit and I spend a whole day on pitching two or three podcasts a week suddenly you're booked out for the next four months you know one right. podcast a week so um yeah it's it's like depending on how fast you want to grow so it, these are very personal goals you have to reverse engineer them knowing what you want to achieve and then there's kind of this investment at the front end of putting your systems in place tweaking what your content expertise is you know uh, it, there's some upfront stuff but once you get all those foundations laid you really can start to gain some traction Yes, exactly. And you can start doing very clever things when, once you get more advanced with your pitching, right? So you can start, you know, batching your pitches yes. and, um, you know, you've got one major story, but you're pitching it to multiple media outlets and then you're working out your slightly different story angles. So everything is still personalized, but you're doing all that work over one or two days as opposed to doing it in bits. So batching creates that efficiency as well. Yeah, I'm a big batching fan. Um, You've given us so much. Is there anything else that you think we need to know before we wrap up and find out how we can follow you or connect with you? Is there like a nugget that you think we've missed? Um, no, I would just say for everybody, you know, don't be afraid of pitching yourself, right? So you just remember that journalists are not gods. So like write it on a bit of paper, stick it on. If, if it is, you know, media outlets you're pitching to. Um, I, I like to use the word journalist, but I actually mean, you know, other content creators, entrepreneurs, bloggers, I use that journalist as a kind of collective term, but yeah. write it on your post, on a post-it note and stick it on your screen and just keep training yourself to remember that, you know, every pitch that you produce is going to be powerful. And, you know, these people, everyone needs to hear your stories. People need to hear your stories. They want to, because yeah. it inspires them and it helps them. Yeah, I love it. So Adela, how can people connect with you, follow you, work with you? Yeah. So um, you can follow me on Instagram at Startups and Co. So that's S T A R T S A N D uh, C O, Startups and Co. on Instagram. And I'm very active on stories. Um, feel free to DM me any questions as well. I'm active on there. I want to just say one thing about Adela's Instagram. She has a very fabulous life. And if you <laughs> want to live vicariously through somebody else's life, go follow Adela on Instagram. She's walking around <laughs> London, seeing famous people. Her emails are amazing. I'm like, what are you at Ibiza? What, is, what do you mean you're at Ibiza party? <laughs> it's just amazing. So, oh, thank you. No, I tried to keep my stories. <laughs> I tried to keep my stories quite quite amusing, right? They so are. I do sh I just share um, things, uh, things I come across. So I don't always talk about pitching in my stories, but, oh, yeah. but I am getting lazy on Instagram. I'm not posting enough on my grid. I'm just putting quirky things on my stories, but everyone is consuming my stories. Very entertaining. <laughs> so follow her on Instagram. And then how else can people connect with you? Yeah. So I actually have a really great little um, freebie for people oh, called yeah. 10 steps to get into the media. Okay. And it's a really, really great 10 step process flow uh on a sort of pdf um and it is shows exactly how i got into um two places actually it's it, it, step by step how i got into red magazine which is a major publication here in the uk and um, we have also a, a famous influencer called dolly alderton and i followed those exact steps to connect with dolly so um it's it actually it genuinely works so i wouldn't i would never put some i put out something that doesn't work so you can download it at pitchdepress.com okay. and get a hold of that 10-step guide and um it just shows you exactly how you can get in the media and there's a real emphasis on you know going to events and building connections and that 
And then um, I know that you have a course and that you work with people privately also. So yes. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I have a course called Pitch to Press, which is a 12 week program. Um, I'll probably be running the next iteration of that in a few months time. Um, but yeah, it's a great 12 week program where um, every week a module drops into the program and people can learn exactly how, you know, where to start with pitching. So you learn how to create your expert topics, you learn how to create your story angles, um, you learn how to craft a really solid pitch as well. Um, there's support on how to actually, you know, I start critiquing people's pitches and giving them feedback on pitches um, you also get to join the pitch to press society which is a secret facebook group i have for everyone that's been on the program so that's a really lovely program so that's a great way if you're really um, wanting to pitch but you're thinking right i need to start dedicating you know an afternoon to pitching or half an afternoon but i really need some accountability and i also need to learn these skills that's a really really great program to join um, i also have a little mini product called Pitch Rockstar. So if you don't, if you're kind of allergic to programs, for example, but love, you know, a nice quick guide, then um, Pitch Rockstar is a really great product for you. So again, you can just email me at hello at pitch to press dot, hello at pitch to press pitch to press dot com, and I can give you the link for Pitch Rockstar, and that's a five hundred dollar product. So cool. yeah, one of the things that we haven't told people about is an exclusive, very small group workshop that we're doing for my community at the yes. end of this podcast you can listen for the information but Adela is running a very small workshop for me it's maximum of eight people and we're going to be able to do a little bit of teaching a little bit of hot seat coaching and time for Q&A so you're actually going to have one-on-one -on -one time with Adela and I will be there also um, but this is something that's only offered we're only offering it once it'll be April 26th and uh, the information will come at the end of this podcast, but I'm really excited about this because I think people need a little more handholding. And I think that's what this workshop is going to help them get. So it's just a, yeah. a 90 minute workshop where you're gonna walk away with some really tangible goodies to get your pitching going. So I'm excited. Yeah, about I am super, super excited about this, Jen. Um, main reason I'm excited about it is because I love stories. Uh, and one of the, um, I'm quite self-deprecating, but the thing that lots of people tell me is my zone of genius is working out really unusual story angles. So I call myself like the story hunter or the story mm -hmm. hacker. Like I, love it. I know exactly what the media is looking for because yeah. um, I sat in a newsroom for a good year at Sky Sports. And so finding an original story hook is, it, you know, is it takes time. And actually that piece of the puzzle is actually quite hard to crack by yourself. What you need is, you know, creative brains in a group to work out a story, and at least by a very minimum, two people. Yeah. So I do this with my clients one on one. I will say, right, what's what, what do you want to pitch? And they'll say, I want to talk about conflict resolution. And so, you know, one of my current clients at the moment is, um, is a conflict resolution person. And, and I said to her, well, the law's changing in a few weeks. The divorce law's changing. That's our hook. So we've been, you know. Brilliant. It's, yeah, it's a really great hook. So. Yeah that's what we need to do for, for your group here. Yeah. And so people hooks. are going to get access to your mind and your, and your brilliant ability to laser in on that. So I'm excited about that. Listen to the end of this podcast for the link about that. And Adela, I just want to say thank you so much because you've shared so much gold with us today. And of course, it's always fun to talk to you. So very, very appreciative. Oh, thank you so much, Jen, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure and I've absolutely loved talking to you all and, and can't wait to see or the, or, you know, the audience being featured in the media everywhere. Yes. Tag us when you get featured. Let us know. Yes. Yes. Um, please do. And so for you who are listening or watching, thank you, because I know there's a lot of options for you to listen to podcasts and watch shows. So thank you for tuning in. It really means a lot. And if you could leave a review for us, we would love that. See you next week. Bye. Bye.